All right, back with the Garlic Marketing Show. I've got Stephen Spencer here. He is an incredible SEO expert. I've known him for a couple of years. Uh, has lots of success. Been doing this for a long time. Written books on it. You know, worked with some major companies. Stephen, thanks so much for being on the Garlic Marketing Show. Yeah, thanks, Ian. It's great to be here. You know, it's fun. For, I like to nerd out on SEO. I think SEO is a lot of fun. It's a lot of. It's scary. I, I want to talk to you about trends. And I want to talk to you about hiring an SEO person because I think that's one thing I see for people, both agencies and just internally, uh, trying to figure out SEO, search engine optimization. Uh, before, let's talk a little bit about you know a little bit about what you do, and you have a couple success stories to share with us, right? All right, sounds great. So I've been doing SEO forever since it just was in its infancy before even Google existed. I was optimizing for search engines like InfoSeek and AltaVista, and uh, that was the mid nineties. So I think of SEO as a, uh, a place where you can tinker and kind of poke and prod at the black box and figure it out, reverse engineer it. So I love doing that sort of thing. And that's what really appeals to me about SEO. It's, it's a science, right? You can figure stuff out. You can have hypotheses. You can test those hypotheses and see if they hold true or not. I invented an SEO platform, a uh, software as a service back in 2003 that I uh, ended up selling along with my company in uh, 2010. So that was, uh, that was a really big win. A lot of uh, serendipity and synchronicity there to make all of that uh, happen. So I... Uh, was being paid on a pay click or cost per click basis for SEO. And who, who can figure that one out? Like that's a, that's, that's like a printing machine for cash. That was pretty awesome. So we were charging uh, 15 cents a click for organic traffic. And we had clients like Nordstrom and, and Zappos uh, using our technology. We actually ended up uh, generating more annual revenue from that technology platform than from our consulting services uh, as an SEO agency. So that was, that was fun. Um, in, in recent times, I've been focused on uh, helping clients that are doing a, something important in the world, doing good and, and making a difference, and not so much trying to collect the big brands. Yes, I've worked with brands like... Sony, Chanel, Zappos, CNBC, Bloomberg Business Week, Best Buy, Bed Bath and Beyond, Quicksilver, et cetera. Um, but that was really my ego, and yeah, trying to keep my ego in check these days. That said, uh, I do have probably the biggest book that you've ever seen on a marketing topic, and that's this one right here. <laughs> uh, it wasn't enough to have just a big book. This is an insanely big book at 994 pages, The Art of SEO. Uh, soon to be in its fourth edition. We're working on a fourth edition right now, so stay tuned for that. That's the third edition I just held up. And I have a couple other books uh, with O'Reilly as my publisher as well that are um, not SEO related, although uh, kind of tangentially uh, so Google Power Search, which is all about kind of find stuff in Google, market research, all that. And then social e-commerce, which is really about driving online sales through social media marketing. So that's a little bit about what I've been up to. Uh, as far as a case study you asked, um, this is a fun one. We, so I donate quite a bit to worthy nonprofits. I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Impact Network. They build and operate school, schools in rural Zambia. And uh, every year I donate SEO audit, a full scale one that's valued at $35,000. I actually charge that. <laughs> it's not just a rack rate. That's, that's really what we charge. But I donated that uh, completely for free. And the top bidder on Charity Buzz then gets that audit and we put in as much uh, time and effort and, and quality of uh, producing that de deliverable versus a cash $35,000 audit. So there was this one uh, winning bidder a couple of years ago, Other World Computing, OWC, uh, at maxsales.com is their website. They've been around forever since, uh, well, their website's been around since the 90s, early 90s. And yeah, they won it. 
and they did a fantastic job and they were so blown away with it. They got, they got so much ROI from it. Seven figures in ROI within two months from that audit that I did for free, but they paid less than $35,000 for in order to, uh, you know, which then built a school in Zambia and uh, had a uh, yeah, multiple, uh, well, just a, a lot of revenue <laughs> generated for me in the process of, you know, after the fact, doing a free audit for them that they were really impressed with and then generating millions and millions of dollars in, in uh, ROI for them. So that was, that was a fun case study. Uh, that was uh, actually all written up into a case study on my website. So if you go to stephanspencer.com and then go to results, there's a section for case studies in there and OWC is, is one of them. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And Stephan, um, so tell me a little bit about, you know, that process. Where, what were those things that you found right away that had that much revenue for OWC? Yeah. What often happens with a very large website, especially one that's been around for a long time, like decades, such as with OWC, they have a lot of cruft, a lot of old, obsolete content that is still in Google and still on the website, and it's just not doing anything for anybody. There's a technique uh, that is super valuable for that kind of a, a crusty old website, and it's content pruning. If you think about a website being kind of like a tree, if you have a lot of dead branches on that tree, the whole tree looks kind of unkempt and, and sickly, right? So each web page is like a branch on the tree. And if there are blog posts from 2007 announcing that in a few months you're going to be at a trade show or whatever, that's not useful content. So the more... Uh, of that you can clean up, get out of Google's index, even if you want to keep it in an archives on your website for whatever reason, uh, but you want it to not clutter up uh, Google's uh, search uh, results and, and index, you can no index that content. I'd say probably just remove it altogether if it's obsolete content. Why would anybody want to access it in anyways? Who'd go back into the archives? of 2007 blog posts, right? So that content pruning initiative really paid dividends. There are plenty of other things that uh, I and my team had found from a technical standpoint, uh, misconfigurations, and just, you don't know what you don't know in terms of SEO. If you're not in that world and you're doing uh, application development for a website, you, you don't know what the implications are of, of choosing a particular uh, you know, uh, JavaScript um, uh, framework over another or some uh, particular uh, WordPress plugin over another and the settings that you set, et cetera. And when it comes back to the content pruning piece, you know, how would someone do that themselves? I mean, it, you know, because there's a lot of people that have 10-year-old websites. What would they decide to get rid of content versus update? Anything that is no longer relevant to the conversation today. So if, so if you're announcing some new update to, uh, I don't know, some software that you're selling, and that's 15 versions ago, it's irrelevant. Nobody cares. If it's talking about a, a new trend that's no longer new, it's some old trend that we've far exceeded with other trends. Uh, let's say that uh, I was writing I, back in 2007 about a, a new search engine. Could this be the Google killer? We'll see. And then it's out of business, right? Delete it. Just delete it. Get rid of it. You might have spent hours doing all sorts of research on it, but nobody cares. It's no longer valuable. So it just it's hard to uh, separate out the, the effort and the emotion and, and everything and, and your kind of ownership of it. So you might want to pull in a third party or at least somebody who's more um, at an arm's length from the situation and say, yeah, I don't think this really matters anymore. If, if and, and, Unless you're just uh, kind of, I don't know, more di um, 
disassociated, not disassociated, but kind of uh, um, able to disconnect from from that content and look at it from a more neutral point of view. So it needs to be uh, valuable to today's conversation and ideally for the future as well. I, I don't spend much time writing content that I don't believe will be relevant in six months or a year's time. I, I have real trouble covering new versions of, of uh, uh, tools and, and, and d doing uh, big exposés about a, a recent Google Core update because what about next core update and the core update after that, et cetera? Like, do we really care about the, I don't know, mid-year 2017 Google update that happened? Like, that's old news. So focus on evergreen content and on content that is uh, really valuable and not, not just a positioning play. Like add, add value, you know, something I, I do that's kind of a, a north star for me before I sit down to write anything, before I end up on a podcast, whether I'm being interviewed or interviewing somebody else for my two shows, for Marketing Speak or Get Yourself Optimized, whether I'm on stage speaking at a conference, I always think to myself, am I going to reveal light? How am I going to reveal light? And I have that intention of revealing light. And that just changes everything. It's just, it's uh, for me, a North Star. That's great. And, and you know, content has changed a lot. Um, so, you know, as you're recommending this with OWC and, and everyone else, you know, how has your, I mean, that North Star is great, but how have you shifted how you're writing content and length and type of content and what additional pieces you're putting in there? Yeah, it's not about the frequency of content writing. It's the quality of it. If you're going to invest time, let's say every week to write something, make it valuable enough that it stands head and shoulders above all your competitors, uh, all, all the even indirect competitors who are writing about that topic. What some SEOs refer to as skyscraper content. It's like a big skyscraper against the skyline of a lot smaller buildings. You stand out. And if that means that you only write or publish, let's say one blog post every few weeks instead of three blog posts a week, it's better. It's much better. And it's not about the length. Some people are saying, well, you know, it's no longer about 800 to 1200 words is the sweet spot for an article. It's really more like two to 4,000 words these days. That misses the point. It's not about word count. Google is not rewarding word count. They're rewarding, or the algorithm is rewarding depth. How surface level or how deep and comprehensive do you go in that content piece? Um, there's a, a, a concept in SEO called LSI keywords. Latent semantic indexing is what it stands for. You don't need to know about it because Google's not even using that algorithm uh, in, in its rankings. Um, but the concept is valuable that if you, so think of an LSI keyword as just a related topic. If you're going to write about lawnmowers and you only cover the surface level stuff and you never mention any of the tangentially related or closely related topics such as landscaping and weed whackers and, and, and grass and lawns and, uh, clippings and horsepower and writing versus uh, push and all that, then it's not a very valuable piece of content. And the AIs at Google are able to ascertain that. So that's, that's really, I think, one of the key things to think about is how, how comprehensive am I going with this content piece? And, and really kind of map out what those uh, related topics or, or LSI keywords are so that you, you, you hit it. You just got to stand out from all the other stuff out there and figure out what a good hook is. Something that is so enticing that it's irresistible for people to click on and to continue to read. You know, just don't do the clickbaity stuff of a number six will blow your mind and it never does. You want to 
under promise and over deliver, not over promise and under deliver, like most clickbait you see, but make it grab you, grab the, the reader, right? So a hook that is um, creating a curiosity gap. It's something I feel a tension <laughs> like in my body and I want to relieve it by reading your content. Because if I only saw the headline and hopefully you didn't give away the punchline in your headline, in your title, so that they are enticed to click to read that article. And then you keep them hooked the whole time. You didn't give away your punchline or your your uh, uh, the, the, the big uh, um, payoff right away. You keep adding value throughout the whole document. Also, no big walls of text. Nobody likes reading that. Like taking a transcript of a podcast episode such as this and just dumping it onto a show notes page, not valuable, not user-friendly, not engaging, and thus it's not going to do well in, in, in search versus turn that transcript into something that it, it feels like a long-form blog post. You've inserted a lot of images in there that are not just gratuitous, uh, useless images. But, you know, if you're going to pull from stock photo sites, have a caption underneath each stock photo that you add. Have it at least metaphorically relevant to what is being discussed and not just, you know, some sort of nonsense where two guys are shaking hands or something. Like no, Nobody gets any value from that. You know, and, and insert pull quotes as well as click to tweets. Not every uh, sound bite is is tweetable. So those that aren't, but you want to make it stand out, uh, feature it as a pull quote in a bigger font size over on, on the side. If you want to see an example of that, of that, any of my episodes for the last seven years on either of my two shows on Marketing Speak or Get Yourself Optimized, if you go to either of those two websites, marketingspeak.com, getyourselfoptimized.com, pick any post, any recent or old episode, it's the entire library has been treated this way. And they rank. They really uh, do so much better than just the short form show notes. Here's, you know, five bullets of what we're talking about in this episode. Here's the bio for the guest. And here is uh, his or her socials and website. That is thin content. Don't do thin content. Google doesn't like thin content. That looks like dead branches uh, or really weak branches on your tree. And you want a really healthy, strong looking tree. Well, that's, that's a lot of great information. So, you know, that said, you know, I talk a lot about video. Video is important. But, you know, how video is incorporated into your website, everyone has a different opinion on what's working, what's not, where to incorporate it, how to incorporate it, put a full video in there, put micro content. What are you finding as best practices right now on incorporating video for SEO? Yeah. So I think in terms of you got two search engines you're addressing here with your video content. One is Google, of course, and the other is YouTube, which is actually the number two search engine by, by query volume. So that's a very important search engine. You don't want to neglect it. And let's say that you have a, a podcast episode such as this, and you embed for you know, um, just convenience for the user, uh, the YouTube of, uh, uh, and player and, and it's a video of this episode on the show notes page. I do that for convenience and for the just simplicity of it for our listeners. But here's the downside. It doesn't count towards the watch time and uh, the view count for, from a, uh, from, from a um, rankings perspective in YouTube. So you might get a lot of traction with people watching and engaging with your, your content, including the video on your website, but none of that is helping you with the YouTube algorithm. And if you really care about that, then you would drive people from the show notes page to a YouTube uh, page with that video and actually make it part of a playlist and drive people to the playlist with that video being the first one on the playlist for them to, to watch. 
so they would maybe end up walking away from the video after getting close to the finish of it and it might play on on for six more hours before they come back and like that's six hours of watch time you just got from that user which uh looks really good to the youtube algorithm so you, it's kind of a uh, you know competing um you, you're you've got some com some competing uh needs here in order to uh, uh come up with i think the right solution do what is best for the user and just know that uh you know, kind of karmically, <laughs> it's it's going the right way for you, right? Don't do stuff that you think is uh, a little bit against the user's best interest because you know it's a super clever thing. Do stuff that adds value and, and like I said, reveals light and know that you're being looked after from upstairs. Oh, that's, that's great, great advice. And, um, and, you know, it, and it's interesting because it's like that back and forth, right, between... What do you do? What's best, and where, where you want to send people to? What's your where do you want to get people going to? Because I mean, I think YouTube is a great strategy, but of course, you want to keep people on your website, and it's it's a back and forth that you need to be doing, um, just like SEO in the old days of keyword stuffing versus not keyword stuffing, which is pretty much gone, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, that never worked well. It never worked well. Might have worked with uh, a lesser search engine like InfoSeek or something like that, but. Uh, Google, it never worked well. Keyword density was never a thing that, that was valuable. It was more about keyword prominence, having the, the phrase at the beginning of the article versus at the end, like, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this whole article was about whatever, right? <laughs> uh, and yeah. Even just looking at the uh, the gaming techniques that are used today, still, they they end up torching your website. So you got to be very careful about who you hire to help you with your SEO because they're they're probably not going to tell you. Well, this is this is gray hat or maybe even black hat, but I'm going to do it anyways because I think I'm going to get you a short term uh, result, which will um, mean you'll keep working with me for the rest of the year and you know it might burn your site to the ground in a couple years time when Google catches up to it but we probably won't be working together uh, by that point like they're maybe you know gonna do that but not narrate it like that to you so you got to be very careful buyer beware when you're hiring SEO services if they're building low quality links that uh, may work short term, and that's a big maybe, <laughs> because Google's really sophisticated when it comes to ascertaining the quality of things like links and and uh, uh, content and yeah, all, all that sort of stuff. So I'd say just aim at being squeaky clean and do your due diligence on, on hiring the right uh, SEO person or company uh, or building your own team. Yeah, because uh, it's a very painful thing to dig yourself out of a hole. It's much better to do no SEO than to do uh, sketchy SEO. I love that because I tell that to people all the time and they're like, well, so-and-so told me this and they could get me this ranking real fast. And, and you know, when we don't, we do a lot of YouTube SEO, but I'm always like, I pretend like I'm sitting in front of Google because it's, it's, you're battling against 26,000 of the smartest people in the world whose one job is to make sure that search is, it has high integrity. And, like, and you think some 17 year old is going to be able to, outsmart Google. <laughs> and, and like you said, it, it causes more problems than it, than it helps. So how do you hire? You know, I know you helped us. You created a document. Uh, we can go to marketingspeak.com slash garlic on hiring and find the right person. But let's talk a little bit about how you decide who's the right person to help you with SEO or how the right team to help you with SEO. Yeah. Well, I have a seven step process. Uh, I call it the SEO hiring blueprint. And that process includes doing some proper vetting of them and uh, having them jump through a few hoops before they even get to the interview. 
once in the interview process, then you're going to have some trick questions that you're going to ask that they're not going to realize are trick questions, but you'll know there's only one right answer to. You don't have to be an SEO expert. You just work off of another cheat sheet that I have called the SEO BS detector. And with those two documents in hand, uh, you'll hopefully, uh, most likely, end up with a really qualified SEO person or, or company working on, on your stuff. So let's start with the vetting process uh, real quick. If you wanted, uh, let's say, an S SEO uh, employee, well, you want to make sure that that person has some attention to detail because if they don't, you know, whew, <laughs> uh, they're going to, uh, it's going to be like a bull in a china shop. Just simple mistake of, uh, let's say, moving the development site to the staging. Or from, so let's just take, for example, the simple mistake of moving the development site to production and leaving the disallowed directive in, in the robots.txt. So what would happen is that the new uh, version of the website would actually prevent Googlebot from crawling the entire website, and it would drop out of the search results. So that's not good, and that happens. You know, that's just a, a, a hypothetical scenario. Hopefully it never happens to you, but it's the case where the developer doesn't know what they don't know about SEO, or they miss uh, some detail. So you want to make sure that you're hiring the right person who has that attention to detail. And this uh, part of the process is, is critical to weed out the folks who have no attention to detail or don't pay attention. And a simple thing you can do is just ask them to put a certain uh, thing, a title in the subject line of the email they send you. Or you could ask them to complete or to, to solve a problem solving riddle, something along the lines of uh, if there's a policeman, a child and a convict on one side of the river and they need to get across the river and there's a boat that only takes two people maximum at a time, uh, figure out how to get everybody across without leaving the convict uh, you know, by himself or uh, the child with the convict uh, by themselves and, uh, you know, just show your work. Okay. And if they don't bother, which most people will not bother, they'll just say, here's my resume. <laughs> and it'll be uh, just a boilerplate thing that they send out to everybody. They're like delete. I'm not even going to bother responding to that. My team will be uh, reviewing these, not me myself, but uh, it's a great way to screen because if they're not following those simple directions, or let's say you put into the instructions to have a um, to leave a voicemail and, and two minute voicemail describing what intrigues you or entices you about the position and the company. And that's the way to start the inquiry process. Do not email, do not send your cover letter and everything. Just fill out uh, or just, you know, send leave us a voicemail. Another thing that you can do in the process of the interviewing is to ask trick questions that you know there's only one right answer to. For example, you could ask about keyword density since we talked about that a few minutes ago. You could say, well, uh, what's the best keyword density to aim for? And of course, the only right answer for that is keyword density. Are you kidding? That's never been a thing <laughs> with Google. Or you could ask something like, uh, you know, about meta keywords. Tell me what your process is for optimizing uh, the meta keywords. And, and hopefully they know that meta keywords never counted in Google. It was never a positive ranking signal. And so they state that that's the case instead of, well, they don't really matter as much anymore as they used to. We don't spend a lot of time on it. Like anything other than what meta keywords, <laughs> they never counted. Anything other than that is a wrong answer. So then you can uh, you know, gently escort them out the door. Uh, I, I had one scenario where I was interviewing, doing a second interview of a uh, head of SEO potent, uh, candidate for a client of mine. And this was a few years ago. And I asked what their favorite SEO tool was. The guy answered Majestic SEO. At that point, my spidey sense, you know, was all tingling because I knew that 
uh, something was up. He was referring to the Majestic tool as Majestic SEO, and they rebranded several years earlier to drop the SEO part. It's just Majestic. So I'm, I, I'm going to start probing, right? So I'm like, oh, cool. I like Majestic as well. What is that metric that is really important in, in Majestic, right? And I just keep quiet and I wait for him to answer. And he answers as I expect him to with the word AC rank, which was deprecated several years prior along the, the same time as when Majestic rebranded. So this guy has not been in the tool for years. AC rank was deprecated, replaced by two metrics, trust flow and citation flow, and I got him. Now, this would require some advanced knowledge of SEO in order to conduct that kind of a, uh, an interview, but you don't have to have that. I created the cheat sheet for you, the SEO BS detector. So there's like a half dozen questions, just weave them into the interview process, do it just real cool, <laughs> nonchalant, and uh, yeah, see what they do. Let's see what we'll see how they respond, and and that will help guide you into whether you're hiring the right person or the right company. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's, it's nice, you know, it's nice to know that those are great questions. You know, once, do you have any tests once they get going and how do you get them trained and how do you know they're doing the right thing? Yeah. So if you properly onboard them and, and give them access to great training. So for example, if you wanted them to learn technical SEO. I have an online course on uh, SEO auditing, how to use Google Search Console and, and glean actionable insights uh, from GSC. All that sort of stuff is in that audit course. <clears throat> so you give them access to certain trainings and then um, I, you, you're going to have to pay them for that time. Who wants to do that on their own time? Somebody would have to be really internally motivated. They probably want to work for themselves <laughs> rather than work for you if, uh, if they're that motivated. So uh, pay them for their time to do the trainings. Uh, have them do a little test project or something, uh, applying what they learned. If, if you're an agency or a service provider, marketing firm, and and you have clients, rather than give them a client, that's kind of a high stakes uh, situation, donate some SEO services to a nonprofit and have that person do some SEO for that nonprofit as a test project or, you know, kind of the with the training wheels on sort of situation. So you want to make sure that they can apply what they learned in a safe environment or low stakes environment and not just passively learn and take notes. So they got to apply this stuff. And then I would uh, also give them opportunities to, um, uh, to, to show that they're hungry and to upskill and, and expand their knowledge across other uh, areas. So for example, if somebody is doing video editing in your company, give them the opportunity to learn YouTube SEO and, and, uh, how to, uh, how, how to not game, but how to, uh, take advantage of opportunities with the YouTube recommendation engine. There's lots of great trainings, for example, from Evan Carmichael on that sort of stuff. I'm sure you, Ian, have tons of great, uh, training materials on that topic as well. So give them access to that stuff if they want and, even send them to events like uh, conferences, Vid Summit. If we're talking about uh, YouTube SEO, if we're talking about Google SEO, well, there's you know so many of them out there. Like everything from MozCon to Brighton SEO over in Europe to uh, yeah, lots <laughs> lots of options out there. And uh, yeah, I, I would give them a lot of independence and and uh, allow them the opportunity be to be proactive. That's great advice. That is great advice. And, you know, I, I love the fact that you have these courses. You're an expert. You've been doing it for years. I know this is going to be super beneficial to a lot of our audience because people have been asking me about it. And I don't have any SEO courses. I just have the basic, my basic, like, 
learn the basics of SEO so you know how to speak it a little bit for business owners, but not this high end technical SEO. Now, when it comes to um, you know hiring and training someone, that is fantastic. But if someone wants to hire you, what is the process for working with you? I, I'm, obviously, you're very selective with clients since you've been doing this for so long and you have a $35,000 audit. What, how do you work with you? Yeah, so to work with me, well, I have a team, all right? So it wouldn't be just sole, uh, solely working with me, but working with my company. A uh, typical retainer for m- month-to-month engagement is 15 k a month. We have clients that are paying more than that, and we have some clients paying less than that, but they aren't getting to work directly with me. Uh, they're paying uh, less than that. They're just working with my my team. Which, you know, they're all vetted and trained and uh, and awesome uh, at what they do. But uh, to work with me to have me involved in the engagement is 15k a month and up. Uh, we also do one-off projects like SEO audits, as you heard. Uh, that's 35k. We do um, offer uh, some coaching. I don't really offer that. Uh, publicly that much but 5k a month for uh coaching with me is what we charge uh that is uh, for an hour long coaching uh, session per week so that's uh how you'd work with uh, me and my team my agency uh, website is netconcepts.com all right all right we'll put a link to that in the show notes yeah so if uh if all this uh online marketing, SEO, uh, YouTube stuff intrigues you and you want to uh, get a, a free university level education in it, uh, just go to marketingspeak.com, which is my online marketing podcast. There are a ton of great episodes on SEO with different uh, subject matter experts in different areas of SEO and uh, YouTube as well. I am being one of the awesome guests on that podcast. I also have a personal development podcast that's got a lot of great stuff on biohacking and spirituality and everything. That's getyourselfoptimized.com. And then my agency website, netconcepts.com, my personal website, stephanspencer.com. And and uh, my socials, you can find me on Twitter, S. Spencer, and Instagram, Stephan Spencer, and yeah, all, all that good stuff, all those different uh, social channels. I'm I'm on all of them. It's my team, though. <laughs> they're they're doing all the heavy lifting. I have no idea what I'm tweeting because uh, they're doing it for me. But yeah, it's good stuff, though. Awesome, Stefan. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Well, it was a pleasure, and uh, yeah, you're you're doing uh, great stuff in the world. You're revealing light, and um, I'm sure your tribe really appreciates you. I appreciate you too. Thanks, Stefan. And thank you all for being on the Garlic Marketing Show or join us on the Garlic Marketing Show. This has been I and Garlic. Uh, make sure to check Stefan out and follow him. And I mean, it's an amazing educational resource on his podcast. So make sure to check him out and let him know you saw him here.